Hey everybody, it's Natalie B. McKenzie with The Whole Woman and welcome to this week's episode of Living Life Authentically with yours truly. Can you just imagine that I am bursting at the seams because it is exactly one week away from my second most favorite time of the year. It's almost Christmas. As you can see from the tree behind me, we are ready to go. This week's episode of Living Life Authentically, which by the way, will be our final episode for the year 2023, is brought to you courtesy of Diageo North America. Thank you so much, Diageo North America. It's been an amazing quarter. Thank you. This has been a great season. We will see what 2024 holds in store. Okay, talking about that. I don't know if you can see, but I am going to scoot my chair just a smidgen so you can get a glimpse of some of the awesome goodies that are behind me. So you may recall two Sundays ago, we got together. We did our annual fundraiser and toy drive. And thank you so much to the friends who attended in person. We needed you in the room. We felt the love to all the sponsors that supported us at Task, Show Me Your Heart Foundation, um, uh, Divorce Dynasty, Shoe Cosmetics, I'm still rocking all things purple, and um, to, of course, Mama Cita Buttercream and all our other in-kind sponsors, Uncle Neris, who showed up, showed out, and gave us the cocktail for cocktail hour. Listen, those of you who donated money, we thank you, because those who donated toys, you brought us quite a bit of toys. We got a head start, but then we needed to get more toys to round it out. So the 47 children that we will be supporting in partnership with the Bergen County Sheriff's Office, those kids in the Polar Express will all receive at least one of the gifts from their wish list. Oftentimes they're getting two gifts, three gifts. So thank you. Okay, that being said, I wanna wish you all a Merry Christmas and get ready for today's guest. Why am I so excited? Well, friend, of course, all our guests are usually friends of ours. That's why they're here. But our guest today is the chief medical officer and co-founder of an organization called Roulet. It's a digital therapeutics company that is developing strategies. Are you ready to delay the onset of cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative um, disease, and stroke? all by targeting on-demand anxiety. Hello, we're gonna be talking about anxiety. The holiday brings down a lot of anxiety for some people and stress reduction. So this is based on well-established link between stress, epigenetics, inflammation, abnormal met metabolism, and disease. Not only is he a formidable neuroscientist, he is also on staff and one of the founding partners of the behavioral, um, psychiatric behavioral um, clinic at Harvard Medical School. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Srini Pillay. That is lovely to see you. Thank you for having me. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Srini, I just tried my best to do a quick synopsis of an intro for you when your resume reads like a book. I didn't even get a chance to tell them you're a multi-published author. <laughs> you have written several books. But neuroscience, psychiatry, and then you're tapping in to the whole use of technology. Who is the young man that grew up to be Dr. Srini Pillay? Tell me about young Srini and where you're from and what went into all that mind to create who you are today. Yeah, you know, I mean, but firstly, I have to just, the caveat is that memory sort of is remarkable because some of what we talk about and think about is true. And it's been shown pretty reliably that a lot of the things that we think we remember, even when we're remembering them clearly, may not actually have happened. That, <laughs> that said, um, I was born and raised in South Africa, in Durban, on the East Coast, um, in a family that was incredibly loving. And I feel like um, during a time when it was, it would be noticeably difficult to grow up during apartheid in South Africa, mm -hmm. I feel like I was really protected by my family and sort of given this idea that regardless of your circumstances and regardless of the adversity, uh, just to have a possibility mindset and to think about how you want to grow in the world. And so for me, 
the love of my mother was a very instrumental part of my life and my brother and my father. My mother was the most overtly loving and in, a, in the most traditional way. My father was very containing and my brother was also very loving. So, you know, I always say to myself, if something doesn't work out in my life, for the most part, I feel like I'm to blame because I feel like I can't really attribute my circumstances, anything that I'm, that I'm going through to anyone in my family. So I grew up in South Africa. I, um, my memories of South Africa were that when, in retrospect, were probably defensive, mm. meaning, you know, people often will refer, you know, and the, the, a lot of the, the laws in retrospect were sort of absurd. Like, you know, there was a, there was, there was actually a, a white beach, a black beach, a colored beach, and an Indian beach. And they all had oh, different. Wait just a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. You just broke that down. Right. It wasn't good enough to just be black and white. They no, had no. to have you broken into color. Talk about a classist, separatist, racist right. society. Yeah, it was kind of remarkable. And it was also like you couldn't, like I could shop in certain places, but I couldn't use the restaurants at those places. I once went to a Chinese restaurant. I wanted to go in and they said, can I help you? And I said, sure, yeah, I want to have some lunch. And they were like, sorry, we don't have a license to serve you. So it was growing up in an environment that was, you know, notably oppressive in retrospect. But the truth is, my memory of growing up in South Africa was is extremely positive. And I think part of that is defensive, in part because I think because I had the permissions I had from, from my parents. When I would walk on the beachfront, for example, um, I would ask, I would say to my mother, I want to play in the fountain. And she would say, I'm sorry, darling, but that fountain's only for white people, for white children. And then a droplet of water would come land in my hand. And the forbiddenness of what that was just excited me so much. And I feel like a lot of the way I dealt with what was going on was to understand that in an environment of restriction, there is something about the, the permission of looking at things um, in, a, in a way that's, that's more mysterious that that actually i think influenced my life from that time up until now so you know i i i think that that my, and and also i don't really equate um a social system with race per se because i think that in just like in corporations in countries there are a few key people who are responsible for keeping certain policies in place yes now, societies contribute to that but I actually feel like it hurts my heart to actually be cynical about humans or to have any kind of negative feeling about humans. And so I just don't have that. I, I feel about people what I feel about them when I meet them. And so mine is not a story of victimization. It's a story of a particular kind of adversity. And the absolute truth is that being a psychiatrist, I feel like even though some forms of adversity are more obviously uh, difficult than other forms. I've dealt with extremely wealthy people who have have been inc incredibly sad and on the edge of suicide. And so, how can you truly compare, um, you know, people's situations? And I certainly don't want to be. I feel like I would be in a privileged position if I used apartheid as an excuse for anything that I didn't get. And so, my general orientation in the world is to allow myself any kind of defensive functioning so that I can manifest what I think I'm here to do, which is to continue to find what my greatest self is and to advance in what that is during my life. So uh, Dr. Srini, tell me about the, the influence or the food that you were fed. And I, I use food interest as a metaphor here, the food that you were fed by your parents in terms of your ability to be whomever you want to be, that led to you exploring the mind in such a way that you have accomplished all that you have accomplished today. And how did you, when did you leave South Africa? Well, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty gritty environment. You know, we, we lived in an apartment building that had 100 stairs with no elevators. Uh, you know, there were all kinds of things happening in the back alleys. There were, uh, so it was, it, it was a little bit like living in a, in a very interesting movie in retrospect. Um, and, and so I feel like a lot of that made me very curious, walking up the dark stairs, going down the back stairs, going down an alley, trying to understand what was happening in the world. It helped me 
understand that there's a way in which you can be curious about the world. But my mother uh, is, is, in terms of her permissions, she would, for example, sit, I'd lie on the bed during the day, and I would take all the clothes out of everyone's wardrobe and start acting out Land's Tales from Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice. And she would just lie in bed and say, bravo, bravo. And, and actually, she was a, and she's somebody who was very innovative. I used to always tell her that if, you know, if, she had, if there were like professorships for mothers, she would definitely have had one and been <laughs> the head of something. Even when my father fought with her, he would say, you know what, your, your mother and I have a disagreement, but honestly, you boys should be very, very grateful. There are no mothers like this in the world. She is exceptional. And so, you know, growing up with that gave me, a, a, you know, I, I actually loved music and I loved science. And when I was in high school, my, my teachers uh, called my parents and they said, look, there are a lot of kids, I'm fourth generation South African, but they said there are a lot of kids of Indian descent who are going to medical school and he'll, he'll definitely get into medical school, but he's equally good at music. We really think it would be great if you could encourage him to do music. And so my father, my father came home and I said to him, um, so what do my teachers want to talk to you about? So he just says in this very abbreviated way, your, your teachers think you should be a musician. I said, and, and what do you think? He said, I think you should do what you want. I don't want to be responsible for whatever happens in your life if you choose the wrong thing. So I said, what? Dad, you're, you're lying. You want me to be a doctor. He said, no, no, I want you to be a doctor. But I don't want you to be a doctor if that's not what you want. So I said, well, then help me talk through this. Like, How do I figure out what I want to do? And he said, well, honestly, medical school is not that easy. I would recommend starting earlier with that and then coming back to music. And maybe you'll find a way of integrating that in your life. And at the time, I didn't really fully understand the gravity of what he was saying. And the way that I came to understand that I wanted to go to medical school was not through my love of science, which was real and I had it. You know, and I, I liked math, I liked physics, I liked biology, I liked music, I liked languages. I, the way that I came to that was I suddenly realized that even as an artist, I would not feel satisfied if I went through life without learning intimately about the human body. So, so whenever I, I was in dissection, whenever I was operating, whenever I was sort of learning about the human body, the experience was both artistic and scientific. I did, it wasn't just the technicality of it or the objectivity of it. The subjectivity of humans fascinates me. And it also fascinates me how we're connected to something much larger than ourselves. Because the body, I feel, is the starting point. And then the idea of exploring the mind is the next level. But my, my real interest is in understanding the collective and in understanding how we can prepare this body to connect with something much larger so that the horsepower with, with, with which we're operating is much greater than just the thing that comes from my brain. So tell me a little bit about your educational background as you were preparing for your next, um, for your tertiary studies and how those choices were made and how you ended up where you did. Tell us about that trajectory. So I, I studied very hard when I was at school and it was, but it was the opposite of having parents who pushed me. Literally my mother would come and put her hands on my head and say, darling, this is not good for your complexion. You should go to sleep. Your sleep is more important. And I was like, mom, I have a test tomorrow. Your test is not important. What's important is for you to make sure you can go to sleep. I don't want you to get sick. And I was like, Mom, I'm going to get sick if you keep on doing this. Just please leave me alone. And everyone would say, do you make him study? And I said, no, I just, I, I was just motivated. And I think some of the things that motivated me were my dad, when, when I was young, before I went to school, actually, he was very strict. And so everyone in the family was was turned to him if they needed anyone to have any kind of discipline of any kind. But he said to me, you know, everyone's looking at me now that I have my kids. And I just asked you for one thing. And I said, I said, what's that? And he said, just make me proud. And I, I and it was, I was the kind of kid who like wasn't, and I, there's no way I'm going to be rebellious about it. I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, I have to figure out how to do this because my parents do so much for me. And so it was with that sense of, of gratitude that I feel like I, I went into the world. But you know, at school, I, I worked very hard. I, I came on first every year at school. And, and my father, we, we didn't have means, but my father said to me when I was in the first grade, because I wanted a different, we had school uniforms and I wanted a new blazer every year. And he said, you know, we, we, can't, we can't really afford a new blazer every year. And I said, 
he said, but you know what I will do? If you come out first, I'll get you a blazer in that year. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> let me try. <laughs> I can try really hard. And so I did that. I did well at high school. I then decided to go to medical school. Um, and when I went to medical school, my brother was also a huge inspiration. Like I remember on the day that I got my final exam results at medical school, I called from a from a phone booth, and I called my brother, and and he was he was like, yes, yes, are the results out? And I said, uh, yeah, I I got a first class pass in obstetrics. I got a first class, pass. and then I said, and I'm the top medical student. And he was like, what? He said, you just made my life. You just he said, <laughs> screamed to my mom and dad, and was like. You won't believe this. He said, this is the greatest gift anyone could ever have given me. So to have that kind of support behind you is, a, is very reassuring and it's very helpful, you know, no matter how tumultuous the world is. So Dr. Shrini, if your family had no means and you're in South Africa, how did you end up at Harvard Medical School? Well, so there's two serendipitous stories. One was uh, I was at a conference um, at, at, uh, it was during my internship and I was at a conference there was a biological psychiatry conference at the Kruger National Park. And I went to this talk of Rob, Professor Robin Emsley gave this talk on water intoxication and schizophrenia or something. And I came out and I was like, I was completely, I was like, what a talk. I love this. Water, talk. Intox water intoxication and schizophrenia? Yeah, right. At that time, biological psychiatry was in its infancy and nobody was really talking about that. And so I stood next to him. And I just, I just thought I'm going to ask. I said, "Excuse me," and he said, "Yes." And I said, um, "I just have a really strong feeling that you could influence my life in a pretty major way." And he looked at me and he said, "Well, young man, what are you interested in?" And I said, "Well, I'm interested in the brain and I'm interested in human emotion." He said, "Well, we have a scholarship that's due tomorrow at the University of Stellenbosch. We've never given it to anyone in psychiatry before. We've never given it to a person of color. So your chance of getting this is." not high but if you do get it it will change your life and i i actually faxed it over to him at the time he walked it over to the committee and a couple hours later i got a call saying congratulations welcome to stellenbosch and i was just sort of like how what just happened like i'm going to stellenbosch and i was the first person of color in that program and i was sort of and when i went there during that year the short story is during my final exam um in in uh, during my final exam at medical school, we had an external examiner for our oral exams. And my external examiner was from NYU. And I had done well at psychiatry. And he looked, his name was Professor Carl Mandel. And he said, young man, you, you're wasting your time in South Africa. You should be at Harvard. And I didn't even know what Harvard was. At that time, I was thinking of applying to Cambridge and Oxford and London. I wouldn't have to do yeah. my exams over again. And so when I was in Stellenbosch in this tiny dorm room, I just decided, one day I said, you know what, what's this Harvard thing? I should look into it. And so I made a couple, and I called Harvard. I called Harvard, the undergraduate campus, and I said, hi, my name is Srini. I'd like to speak to the head of Harvard, please. And they said, um, head of Harvard what? And I said, you know, medical school. They said, well, you're through to the undergraduate campus. This is not. So I get through to the medical school. The medical school secretary then says, uh, there are different departments here. What department do you want? And I said, psychiatry. And so she put me through to the head of the Department of Psychiatry, who was Joe Coyle at the time. And his secretary happened to not be at her desk. So he picked up his phone and, and said, hi. And he said, he, I, I trained at that hospital subsequently. He never did that previously. So it was sort of interesting that that happened on that day. And I said, hi, my name is Srini Pillay. I'm just sitting in South Africa. And I'm thinking, boy, wouldn't it be great to be at Harvard? And he told me later, I thought, this guy lost a couple of marbles. Like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, I said, you know, but th it's a place. And there must be a way of getting in there. And he said, well, why don't you send me your CV and send me a note and I'll distribute it. And so I said, sure. So I sent him my CV. And I mean, I knew I had done well, but a lot of people do well and don't necessarily take that extra step to actually explore what they want. Mm -hmm. And so... He circulated it, and Jonathan Cole, who was the father of psychopharmacology, um, picked it up and was curious about it, and so set up a, a phone interview with me and, and, and said, well, thank you very much. I'll let you know what we think. And a couple of weeks later, I get a FedEx saying, congratulations and welcome to Harvard. And so it was just such a remarkable set of events because th none of this was came from 
you know, extensive planning or targeting. <laughs> no five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Srini, I I hate the fact that we're on a timer, but I am very curious about um, some of the areas in which you've specialized. And I know one of your, your key areas is the area of anxiety, anxiety disorders. And you have written extensively about this. You're very involved with the Harvard um, um, Psychiatric Behavioral Department. Tell us about the study of anxiety and what is it that you do and your approach that is so different from others and direct us to some of your books. I'm very curious about that more than ever, especially as we approach the holidays. Sure. So I directed the Outpatient Anxiety Disorders Program at Harvard, and I also directed the uh, Panic Disorders Research Program in the Brain Imaging Center, where I studied brains for 17 years. So my background is in brain science and in clinical anxiety. And so I'm in a very privileged position to be able to talk about applied neuroscience. In fact, I um, pioneered a field called neurocoaching, where I work with leaders globally, helping them build more resilient, agile, and creative teams. And what is different about my approach to anxiety is that I connect cognitive and deeper psychoanalytic and spiritual ideas to the brain and how the brain operates, and then give people recommendations on how to decrease anxiety based on what specific interventions change the brain. So for example, if someone said to me, I'm feeling really anxious about the holidays and, and you know, I, I like my family, but I don't really like them. And I'm not sure if I have enough presents and I don't know what to do. The, there's, a, there's a mnemonic that I have uh, called CIRCA, C-I-R-C-A, mm -hmm. uh, where, where if you follow what each letter stands for, you can actually, each letter stands for something that has been shown to change brain activation in the anxiety centers in the brain. So the first C is for chunking, which means when you break something down, like let's say you, you're you thinking of all of Christmas and you're, like, and you're getting really anxious because Christmas is just one big chunk. But if you say, what do I do from now until Christmas? What do I do on Christmas day? What do I do the day after Christmas? If you start chunking that down, that's a way of decreasing your brain's overly anxious response. Mm -hmm. Also, ruthless prioritizing. Like, what are the three most important things to me during this holiday period? And how do I prioritize those things? And the third thing is, what can I delegate? If there's something I don't want to go to, maybe somebody else can go to that. So chunking is a form of breaking things down, ruthlessly prioritizing, or delegating. The I stands for ignore mental chatter which means that in general, when you're anxious, your brain's on and on and on. I can't believe this. Am I going to do this? Ignore mental chatter is a form of mindfulness. So you sit back in your chair, you close your eyes, you place your attention on your breath. And then whenever your mind starts wandering, you bring it back to your breath. This has been shown to protect genes. It's shown to decrease amygdala activation. So it's a pretty powerful technique. The R is reality check, which is essentially this too shall pass. No, like a lot of times you have horrible things happen and there's just no positive side to that but we need to figure out a way to leave those things behind so that we don't we don't just keep obsessing over them the second c is control check which is like the serenity prayer how do i how do i control what i can control and let go of the stuff that i'm not i'm not going to control if you open the newspaper and there are 700,000 horrible things happening why remember these things or even look at them if you're not going to do anything about them you okay. know lady Lady Gaga was actually uh, did an interview, which I often will show in corporate events, where she said that she reached a point in her life where she was totally burnt out, and and she didn't know she did, she didn't want to take selfies, she didn't want to promote perfumes, and then she realized the thing she had to do was to say no. So I, I just need to say no. I can at least say no to three things, and so she started to say no, and that was her form of control check. Mm -hmm. And then attention shift is when you shift your attention from the problem to the solution. Like, oh my God, the holidays are coming up. I'm so anxious. You can think about that as much as you want, but what if you say, how do I solve this? How about I put boundaries around how long I spend time with certain people? How about I accept that I have the means to give whatever I can give and I don't get anxious about that? And once you start focusing on solutions that can help you. Now, each of these steps, chunking, ignore mental chatter, reality check, control check, and attention shift, each of those steps has actually been shown to change brain activation to reduce anxiety. So what I do is I generally have 
a lot of different ways of doing this. Actually, I'm going to have, by March or April of next year, I will have a, a chat bot that mm. people can ask me whatever they want to ask me, like you're speaking to chat GPT, and the <laughs> chat bot will, will answer back. So I've taken all my intellectual property and sort of and developing a chat bot based on that, because the, the idea of targeting the brain is important. What I want to say, though, is that I don't think it's as oversimplified as just being about human tissue. I, I think psychodynamic formulations are really important. You know, for example, while I'm talking about anxiety, I will say to people that Kierkegaard, the philosopher, said anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. If you think about that, what he's saying is we say we want to be free, but when we're free, it feels like we have no gravity, no weights. So we do whatever we can to build balls and chains into our lives to all, in order to keep ourselves stuck. You know, psychoanalytically, another way of thinking about anxiety is anxiety is the cry of the self in the process of becoming. It's not always, it's not always negative. When we are becoming, when we start anything new, when we are growing into the fullness of who we are, anxiety is a signal that that process is happening. It doesn't have to be something that you just dispel with immediately. So I, I tend to integrate to more superficial cognitive techniques, but also these deeper philosophical, psychodynamic, and spiritual ideas as well. Did you just say anxiety is the cry of the self in the process of becoming? I did, yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure I got it right because there is so much to dig in there and that's that's our next martini talk. So right. <laughs> Dr. Srini, you have written at least six books. The one that I wanna really talk about today, I think sort of encompasses um, the way your mind works in full 360, forward and backwards. And it's tinker, dabble, doodle, try. And I like that it says, try. Unlock the power of the unfocused mind. That is something. Let's talk a little bit about this. Sure. So, you know, in, in the human brain, we have these focus circuits, which are very important. Um, but there are disadvantages to focus as well. Focus can drain your prefrontal cortex of energy, make you not care at the end of the day. Focus can make you not know what's going on around you. It's like Anne Wang, when he was, he had the personal uh, sort of pr word processor, he didn't even notice PCs were coming up, and so he became bankrupt. Focus also keeps you with your nose to the grindstone, so you don't look at upcoming trends like AI. Focus also keeps you stuck on one point, so you can't innovate because innovation requires making connections. And the self circuit in the brain is it actually overlaps with the unfocused circuit. Now, when you focus, there's a, the unfocused network does not come up. It's called the default mode network. We used to think of it as the do mostly nothing network, but mm -hmm. actually, it does really important things. When you unfocus, your brain you are able to think more abstractly, complexly. The level of detail that's pulled up is much greater. So we must learn what I call cognitive rhythm, which is Instead of going focus, 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 fatigue, and then you're out for the count, it's focus, unfocused to refuel, focus, unfocused to refuel. And the more we can do that, the more we can take care of our brain. So in the book, I describe a variety of techniques in which you can strategically unfocus amidst a day of focus so that you can rejuvenate your brain and take your own intelligence to the next level. So a lot of people use only the focus network, but they don't use the unfocused network. And so just napping for it, five to 15 minutes of napping can give you one to three hours of clarity. Doodling, scribbling on a piece of paper can improve memory by 29%. There's a technique called positive constructive daydreaming, which is taking 20 minutes, doing something low key, like knitting or gardening or walking, whatever's low key for you. And then instead of looking outward all the time, you look inward. It's called perceptual decoupling. And when you have this perceptual decoupling, you start imagining yourself on a yacht, or running through the woods with your dog. And this actually increases your creativity and gives you the brain energy that you want. And, and you know, there are lots of other booster breaks for 15 minutes can improve social cohesion, decrease your burnout. So I talk about a lot of different things, including possibility thinking, which is in some ways the story of my life, which is sort of believing in possibilities and letting your beliefs guide you so that you... And you do concrete things in the service of that, but your beliefs are still an important part of who you are. That's wonderful. Dr. Srini, I know we're going to have to continue this conversation at another point in time. How can our viewers stay in touch with you? How can they follow you, find you, and get your books? 
Uh, well, I'd love for people to connect with me. I, I, so my website is drsrinipillay.com and neurobusinessgroup.com. And I my Instagram is Dr. Um and, and I can also be found on Twitter um, at Srinipillay MD, I think it is, or just Srini Um and, and you can follow me on the websites and, and think uh, Instagram's a good place to start because I post daily and I try to share sort of what my latest thinking has been. I, I tend to think, and I'm also, I just also finished writing musicals. So I'm really interested in integrating all these different ways of living into life. And what I hope to do is to inspire other people to experience the joy of being alive and not just confine themselves to what people said they thought they should be. That is that that says it in a nutshell. I think so many of us get stuck in the construct of what we think should be versus just freely living and allowing ourselves to free fall in a little bit of daydream and living the possibility. I am so excited to continue this conversation with you. We look forward to chatting with you soon. We want to wish you a happy, happy holiday. And for our viewers who may have missed it, Dr. Srini's amazing wife was on with us a few weeks ago, and she too is a psychiatrist, and she approaches it from a whole different angle. We'd love to have you both together. Remember, check him out at Amazon.com. It's DrSriniPillay.com. He's Dr. Srini Pillay on Instagram, Srini Pillay MD on Twitter just connect. He's exciting. It's, oh, and don't, you can't miss the fashions, by the way. We didn't talk about the fashion. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. We'd so look forward to chatting with you again. And thank the book, so my favorite is Tinker, Doer, Dabble, Tinker, Dabble, Doer, Try. Doodle Try. Yes. Doodle Try. I love it. We've been talking with Dr. Srini Pillay, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you so much for joining us. This is your final episode for 2023 because we're going to go off and do what we do best at this time of year. It's spend time with family, enjoy the holiday chair, drink lots of sorrel, eat black cake because, you know, I'm Jamaican. So we've got to do the traditional things time with the family. We hope you have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful holiday season. And if you've lost a loved one during this time, we know you're still grieving. And with that, we say we wish you just so much love. We send you joy at the season and there is still something to be hopeful for. Joy comes in the morning. I wish you enough life to live, enough joy to give, enough love to share. I wish you enough. Be well. <laughs>